So you look at the the, the <laughs> sheer joy of this movie. It was potentially deemed and being debated as communist propaganda. Um, so let's push pause in that, and we're going to answer that. I think Frank Capra um, had already had some trouble with some censorship boards kind of going into this and had some criticism on his film. He was on the radar, so to speak. Yeah, as were a lot, but he was on the radar. So for Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Which, of course, great, is also Jimmy Smith. Jimmy Stewart. Right, which is Jimmy Stewart and Frank Capra, this sort of idealized version of a young politician exposing corruption and um, using down-home sensibility and ethics to try to get his his foot into Washington. and Every and, man in America. That's right. To, um, the problem. Sort of a beautiful story, again, on theme for him as an individual. At the time, so we're going back now, five years, Joe Kennedy, who was at the time the U.S. ambassador to the U.K., writes a letter to Bill Hayes. Yes, this is of the Kennedy family, of course. Right, Bobby and uh, Jack's dad. Yep who had some roots, I think, in bootlegging early and had now sort of gotten a little more mainstream, writes a right. letter to- Once you get to... the money, you get the power. <laughs> Once you get the money, you get the power. I think that's true. So he sends a letter to Will Hayes, who's the president of the Motion Picture Producers and Distribution Group. This is Joseph Kennedy. This is Joseph Kennedy, who's currently the US ambassador to the UK. So he's worked his way up, right? He's himself in politics. He says, I have just seen Mr. Smith goes to Washington. I consider this one of the most disgraceful things I have- ever seen done to our country. To permit this film to be shown in foreign countries and to give people the impression that anything like this could happen in the United States Senate is to me nothing short of criminal. To me. That's right. So he's making a plea. Um, there was also a plea um, to the head of the studio who was Cohen at the time to not release the movie. This movie was a threat on that level, and Frank Capra himself said in an interview, early before the movie came out, you let reviewers look at it, and there was a group of reviewers in Washington, D.C., and while the movie was getting favorable response from people, this group of critics and reviewers in D.C. destroyed the movie, hated it, said it was terrible, didn't support the movie in their writings, and he felt that it's because potentially it was sort of revealing maybe a threat to their business of politics. I guess we're saying this because I think there were some seeds that were sowing early with some of his work. Capra put a target on his back with a few influential people. I think that's right. And his movies about individuality maybe were somewhat of a threat to certain establishments. At least that's how they felt. That's how he saw it. So you come to this movie and this brings us back up to the FBI investigating it. So there's sort of Communist propaganda, a bit hysteria post-war. Yeah, it's, it's starting. It's Our Next Foe is sort of internal communism. Right. Right. So It's Our Next Foe, and this guy with a target on his back is deemed this potentially It's a Wonderful Life, is said to be communist propaganda. Sympathetic towards- And Ayn Rand, who had written some very large memos, was citing things in American culture that could be deemed this way, was one of the first to kind of put a target on this movie and bring it up. This had to go before committee hearings. This movie was reviewed. They kicked the tires of it. And ultimately, I, I want to read this to you because I think it's interesting. Yes, it's please. accusation in its saving grace. This led to the FBI to investigate the film, culminating in its mention during the House Committee on Un-American Activities. The chapter was closed when the film was defended by writer Charles Moffat who he himself was an ex-communist, <laughs> he was reformed, and an expert witness. He said that while the banker was portrayed as a villain and the power of money was portrayed as potentially oppressive, it also showed that money can be used benevolently. It, I think, goes into the bucket of there can be these narratives, maybe in America at times and maybe in all places, in communities, certainly in Hollywood, where there's either a certain type of storytelling that you want or that you don't want. And I think it's so odd to look at Mr. Smith Goes to Washington and It's a Wonderful Life and realize that they were subversive right. <laughs> to and, certain groups in America and potentially around the world. And you take this attack on It's a Wonderful Life then, and it ends up in the Vatican's top 15 films that show virtue. <laughs> 